Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Knowledge Quarter's second virtual event of the year, where we'll be bringing you an exclusive private view of RCP Unseen, um, presented by the Royal College of Physicians. My name is Bav Mehta, and I'm the events manager at the Knowledge Quarter. Amongst our proud partners is the Royal College of Physicians, and we're absolutely thrilled to be partnering with them for today's event. The RCP of London was founded over 500 years ago um, in 1518 by a royal charter from King Henry VIII. Um, it, it is England's oldest medical college, um, and today the RCP continues to play a vital role in raising medical standards and shaping public health. Um, now, in this event, we're going to get a glimpse of the history of medicine like you've never seen it before. Um, the RCP has been collecting objects and works of art and recorded interviews and rare books and documents for over 500 years. Their vast collections work hard behind the scenes in forming current research projects, enriching RCPs, ceremonies, and reaching international audiences through events and exhibitions. In this virtual private view exhibition, um, colleagues from the RCP's library, archive, and museum have selected rare and fascinating items from their collection to explore many for the first time. We're going to be discovering how the RCP's historical objects are being used by scientists and researchers today to learn more about disease and medical practice and how a 500 year old collection continues to grow and discover some of the surprising items that you would never expect a physician to own. Now we're delighted um, to be joined by Lowry Jones, a senior curator at the RCP. So I'm going to pass it over to Lowry. I'm going to just stop sharing my uh, slides at this point so Lowry can um, upload hers. Thank you everyone for joining us today. It's really lovely to see that you're enthusiastic to hear about our exhibition. Um, so I'm going to be telling you about um, the Royal College of Physicians Museum's new exhibition RCP Unseen. So that is what RCP stands for, Royal College of Physicians. For those of you who are not familiar with us, the RCP is a medical charity which represents about, actually I think it's nearly up to 40,000 now doctors worldwide. And the core mission is to improve patient health and reduce illness in sort of a very broad sense through lots of, through lots of different activity. But as well as being a modern healthcare charity, um, it's also an organisation with a 500 year history. And this history is looked after by the archive library and museum team, with which I am part. So we care for a huge range of collections about both the history of the college and the history of physicians and medicine in general. And this ranges from rare books and artworks to medical instruments, silverware, letters and manuscripts. In more normal times, these things would be available for research and displayed around our Regents Park building. And they're also used in our active exhibition and events programme. But as you've probably noticed, these aren't normal times and so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a scene setting about actually how you do an exhibition when you can't get into your building. So as a medical organisation, the RCP has you know, rightly been quite cautious about having staff in the building at all over the last year. And so most of the museum team have been working from home also almost exclusively. So when we were planning a public programme for 2021, this initially was quite difficult, particularly because I tend to just go into the store and kind of stare at things to gain inspiration and I couldn't do that. But the unusual circumstances have actually given us a really nice opportunity to dig a bit deeper into what we have. So exhibitions usually include a lot of loans from other organisations, from other museums, but we're lucky enough to actually have a lot of our collections available online. So there's a lot that we've been able to access, even though we've not been in the building. And because the RCB has been collecting for such a long time, there's a lot that we actually have available digitally to get your teeth into. So at this point, I was planning on having some nice video footage to show you of the exhibition in the building, but lockdown um, three happened. And so all I've got is this screenshot, I'm afraid. <laughs> However, this was actually always intended to be a hybrid exhibition. So primarily online, but also in the building at whatever point we are able to open again. So we do hope that we'll be able to welcome you in person later in the year. Um, the web address is there in bold, and I believe that Gail will also put it in the chat for you. So if you'd like to um, have a look at that while I'm talking, I will, you know, not be offended. You do not have to stare at my slide chair. So anyone who works in a heritage organisation or works with any kind of historic collections, like they always have some favourite items that they've never been able to 
get out or had much of a chance to share with everyone. And this was our chance to do that. RCP Unseen displays some of the items that we've never had a chance to show you before. So some of the stories which we haven't had a chance to tell and also to show some of the ways that the collections are used when they're not on display. And it's also been a really nice project to work on because each member of the team has selected some of the items that have gone into the exhibition. And so it's kind of quite personal in a way. And actually I feel even more fond than normal of some of the things that we've kind of included in it. So I obviously don't have time to talk you through every single thing that's in the exhibition because we would be here all night. But I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the eight sections or the eight display cases as it were. Um, of the exhibition. And these aren't in a particular order, but I'm going to roughly do them in the order they are online, just, just for simplicity's sake. So our first section is tools of the trade. And the tools that physicians and others have used over the years is perhaps something you would expect the RCP collections to have. But tools aren't necessarily just the physical objects that you might think of. So we do have this kind of physical thing, of course, such as this cautery iron, which you're looking at here. This would have been heated and applied to the skin to treat wounds. Or this lancet, which was used for bloodletting and for things like vaccination. So this one is one of my favourites, because if you look closely at its guard, which is the right hand picture, you'll see it's got gems scratched into it, which is my surname. So obviously I like it. But I also like the idea that this doctor was kind of trying to stop his colleagues nicking his stuff. Like, that's the main reason you put your name on, isn't it? Either people taking it or he's a bit forgetful and he keeps leaving it around the place. Which I just really like that idea, sort of that little personal link. Knowledge is also an important tool in medicine. And this is, as, oh, excuse me, um, and what people do with that knowledge, again, is equally important. So because of this, you'll find various paper-based items in this section of the exhibition. Um, for instance, this book, which is by Peter of Spain, and it's a manual of diseases and remedies known at the time in the 16th century. There is also this document, which is not perhaps the most visually exciting, but um, is quite interesting. So it records instances of leprosy in the families of patients in Chennai in India in 1864. These were observed by a doctor called Henry Porteous and his observations showed that leprosy was actually a disease related to living conditions. At the time, the British medical establishment thought it was genetic and despite Porteous's observations, he reported back to Britain to the college, as did other doctors. Despite this, the sort of general medical establishment just pretty much ignored this for quite a number of years. Moving on, we come to our next section, which is the patient voices. So there's many voices that are generally silent in medical collections, which is due to you know, huge numbers of things, but particularly how collections have developed and particularly how medical collections have developed. They often tell the stories from the doctor's or practitioner's point of view. And so in this exhibition, we wanted to show the other side. So the voices of the patients. And one really quite moving example of this is this book, which is the diary of a man called Augustus de Este, which is a fantastic name. Um, and he recorded his experiences of living with multiple sclerosis in 19th century London. The diary covers the two years before he died in 1848, and it shows a man sort of staying positive and keeping track of his symptoms and managing them. So on 1st and 2nd of August in 1847, he wrote triumphantly that during the day, I do not lie down on the sofa. And I rejoice to note that I walk in my room one hour and five minutes, which, if you look at other times, is sort of fairly long for him. That weekend, though, he obviously took a slight turn for the worse because he went to church but didn't hear anything because of where he was sat and doing to my complaint. He also writes that, alas, I only walk in my room six minutes. So you can see it very much fluctuating. And this sort of personal experience is often really hard to find in medical collections because they focus on the kind of more scientific or the doctor's perspective. And I'm really pleased that we've actually been able to include some stories of patients in the exhibition, particularly this sort of thing, these patients in their own words. So moving on, we also use this exhibition and particularly its hybrid online and hopefully physical nature to try something that we haven't done very much before and that is directly speaking to our audiences to ask what they wanted to see. 
And that is what brings us to this section, which is very imaginatively titled audience selection. We ran a poll on Twitter at the start of January to select one of four objects um, that will be uh, excuse me, that will be highlighted in detail in this section. For the opening, the winning object was this object, uh, this book, which illustrates the le legend of Melusine, which is a European folk legend about a part woman, part serpent water spirit. Um, Melusine beat the runner up, which was this one, which I wanted to include just because I really like it, um, a stained glass portrait with some very significant conservation work. Um, and she beat, she beat uh, Antington by a very long way. I'm going to leave you to find a bit more about Melusine yourself, though. We have kind of extended information about her on our website. Um, but the next poll is coming up uh, in the not too distant future. So early April, we'll have it on our Twitter page. So do keep an eye out for that. And we'll be running it every quarter for the rest of the year. Next, we come to surprising discoveries. Today, we have established criteria for what objects work, work uh, excuse me, for what objects, works of art and documents uh, and also books that we collect. But this hasn't always been the case. So in the past, doctors were often quite enthusiastic collectors themselves um, and their personal collections were frequently gifted or bequested to the college, meaning that we have a number of items that you might not expect us to have in the collection. And one example of this is this fantastic ink on paper painting by Chinese artist Zhu Bei Hong. So Zhu is known for his paintings of galloping horses, and you can really sense the energy of the horse in this painting. You know, it's almost bursting out of the frame. But we don't know how it came to be in our collection. It might have been a gift from a visiting dignitary or perhaps a representative of another healthcare institution. We know that's a way that a reason we do have some things, but we just do not know. We have a number of items like this where the provenance of the history is fairly unknown. Our next section um, returns to things that you probably would expect to find in the college's collection, uh, and this is teaching doctors. So the teaching and training of doctors has been important to the work of the Royal College of Physicians for its whole 500 years history, and it's a because of that, it's a really strong theme in our collections. In this section, we pulled out some of the more interesting items that we've uh, not been able to show recently. And we also focused on another quite often silent voice in the collections, which is that of the medical student. So we have lots of things that represent the experiences of, you know, qualified and fairly high, high up doctors. But that sort of starting point, the medical student, the lower level doctors is, again, not something that has historically been recorded that much. So, for instance, the medical, the medical students in this section, we have this book, which is a book of bound lecture notes. Every other page was left blank to allow the students space to actually make their own notes against the lectures. We don't know who it was that owned this book, so we don't know the identity of the student, but you can tell that they've been particularly, you know, they've been fairly diligent in their note taking. This section also features what is possibly my favourite object in the whole exhibition. Um, I had no idea we had it until I was talking to our assistant archivist about what things he might want to include in the exhibition. So you can't really tell from the pictures, but this is absolutely tiny. It's about five centimetres square. And it is a whole physiology textbook that has co been copied out in tiny handwriting onto this really dinky little pile of paper. It was smuggled into an RTP entrance exam. So to become a member of the college, you have to pass uh, various membership exams. Um, we think it was sort of perhaps the 1970s, sometime late 20th century, but again, we're not entirely sure. And the reason that we actually have it is because the person was caught and it's in the archives under the misconduct files. So it's a really impressive object. Like there's so much information in such a tiny amount of space. You can see particularly that bottom left picture, it's really crammed in. And it can't have been very easy to use. If it's, it's that big, so if you think about trying to read that surreptitiously under the table, like maybe that's why they were caught. Um, and it must have taken a fairly significant amount of time to copy out. So I do wonder if they might have perhaps been better spent just using that time to revise normally. But we will never know. Our next, uh, sorry, our next collection, our next section is about researching the collections. Um, and this, again, it's one I'm really pleased we've been able to include because 
I think there's often the impression that, you know, historic collections, museum collections, just sit in storerooms and don't really do anything. And that is very far from the truth. So as well as the obvious uses such as exhibitions, um, all of our collections are accessible to the public for research or kind of general interest, um, et cetera. And as part of this, there are a lot of actual research projects currently running that are using the collections. Um, and these cover all sorts of topics. So one that is someone's currently doing a PhD on is looking at women's ownership of medical books in Tudor and Stuart, England. There's another project um, working with some of our medical items, working to map the development of smallpox. And there's others which are re-evaluating various historical knowledge and sort of areas of knowledge. And this last point is why this item that you're looking at is in the exhibition. It's a glass prism from the 18th century and the note on the base of it there says that it once belonged to Isaac Newton, which is who, as well as being famous for discovering gravity, also did a lot of mathematical work and work in physics. And one of his other major discoveries was that light can be split into a spectrum of different colours. Um, and the way that he experimented to discover the light spectrum was using glass prisms. Uh, Yoshimi Takawa of Tokyo Institute of Technology is working on a project to analyse the prisms that are linked with Newton because there's various ones across different museums in UK and also on the continent. Um, and she's using study of the prisms and her own copies of Newton's experiments to study his experimental process. At the time, sort of when Newton lived, various other scholars had difficulty replicating his experiments with light. And although Tekawa's work is ongoing, her investigations suggest a reason why this might have been the case. Um, and this also could have some interesting implications for museums. So in a, to keep it simple, there's two types of glass that were commonly used in 18th century prisms. One is called flint glass and one is called crown glass. And they bend light differently because of the slightly different makeup of the glass. So Newton's notes show that he used crown glass in his experiments, but Tekawa's experiments show that our prism and most of those in other museums were made of flint glass, um, which again suggests there may not have actually been owned by Newton. I'm going to say this is still all ongoing, so it's there's nothing confirmed, but it's quite interesting to, to see what I suspected, which was that it prob someone has said that this was owned by Newton, but actually we don't think that that's really the case. Although this kind of might seem like a disappointing outcome, I think the story in itself is quite interesting. And I'm hoping at some point to be able to do some research in our archives to try and figure out why the doctor, presumably it was a doctor who donated this to the college thought that it had a relationship to Newton because there was presumably something there which made them think that. So these last two sections, I'm going to talk about in a slightly different order to the way they are online, just because it fits a little bit better. Um, and therefore, the next section we come on to is doctors and their image. If you say the word doctor to someone, that likely conjures up quite a specific image in that person's head. You know, perhaps someone in a white coat, maybe with a stethoscope. Um, and again, how doctors see themselves is probably also different. Um, you know, thinking about doctors today. And then similarly, both the way doctors see themselves and the way the public have perceived them has changed massively over time. And to illustrate this, I want to show you these two objects in front of you now. So these two contrasting pictures. So the first one on the left is a portrait of a doctor called Richard Mead, who was physician to George II, and he lived in the 17th and 18th centuries. And what I want to show you in particular is his coat. So you can see the material looks kind of shiny, and that's because it's brown silk velvet. The sleeves are really wide and the coat itself is long. It's almost down to his knees. He's, got, he's also got these really elaborate cuffs on his wrists and a lot of very oddly shaped square buttons. So that's very unusual for the time. So all of these are an explicit demonstration of wealth and of social standing. So the material is luxurious and the, the large amount of both material and accessories and these all show that he is able to spend extravagantly on his outfit. 
Mr. Mead's chosen to show himself this way in his portrait as a wealthy, important, learned doctor. He's projecting a very particular image and he's specifically chosen to show himself like this. I want to contrast this with the image on the right, which is quite a different view of doctors. <coughs> this was made in the last 20 years of Mead's life. And it's called the company, uh, excuse me, the company of Undertakers by William Hogarth. It's a fictional coat of arms and it's mocking physicians. At the time, a walking stick was the symbol of a doctor and this group sort of grotesquely sniff theirs and they're also sticking their fingers into a urine flask. At the bottom, in the bottom corners, you can see there's two pairs of crossbones and the Latin motto means and many an image of death. Hogarth is suggesting that doctors are basically worse and useless and that they're more likely to cause death than to cure it. To, sorry, cure death than to cure anything, uh, which is a slightly different representation of doctors than Mead's self-aggrandizing view. I also want to quickly show you this image of a couple of our possibly more unexpected items in this section. So I'm not going to tell you about these. I just want to whet your appetite so you go and explore online yourself. But these are a cycling jersey and a bejeweled stethoscope, and they have particular stories related to individuals behind them. So I hope you'll go and check it, check them out online. Our last section is collecting today. So kind of, again, bringing things up to date, which I always, always like to do to show how the history doesn't end in the past. So the College of Physicians collections reflect the college's 500 year history, but we are still collecting. You know, history doesn't stop, which I think I have been particularly thinking about in the last year. And we want to be able to tell today's stories into the future. So this section includes a number of items that we've recently added to the collections. And it also shows a huge variety of things that we collect. So from portraits of modern physicians to books, to objects used by people in the past to sort of treat themselves at home, um, modern medical equipment, and also artworks reflecting contemporary medical issues. And that last point is what I am showing you here. This is a digital print by artist Phil Shaw and it's called Shelf Isolation. It was produced in 2020 during the initial stages of what we now know as lockdown one. And you may have seen it in the media last year because it was in various newspaper articles for a while. The images are all of real books and Shaw has rearranged them to spell out a story about isolation and about lockdown. When he made it, he intended it as a much needed message of hope. But almost a year later, the sentiment that it must end soon, which is in the titles lends a possibly more cynical reading to the message because you know it hasn't ended soon at all um, or perhaps that's just me so that is a really quick whiz through our exhibition that is the uh, url again in case that's helpful i've obviously not been able to tell you about everything um, because that's a really tiny fraction of the things that we have on display but you know thank you so much for listening um please do go on the website to have a closer look because there's huge amounts to explore there and as i mentioned with the audience selection things we will be refreshing it throughout the year and um we will obviously announce things in our newsletter and on our social media uh, when we are able to open in person um, as you can see here we also we are now running online uh live guided tours uh, they will start for March if you'd be interested and we also have a variety of events online which you can book on to. And I think that is me, Bav. So I guess is it question time now? Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, we are going to have a bit of a QA. and a um, If anyone has got questions, do feel free to add them into the um, uh, chat and I will try to weave them in as much as possible in my in my in my conversation. Um, so I'm going to begin with um, something going back from what you've just said more recently in your in your presentation. Um, obviously, we're going through a pandemic, and um, have you found when you were collecting this? Have you found many objects and many uh, things that that refer to previous pandemics that we've had? Um, in our 500 year history of the RCP, was there anything there that gives an insight into how doctors, physicians, or how patients, or how the public reacted in those times? 
Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the role of the college has kind of varied a lot over its history, but it's because doctors who have been part of it have always been very involved in the general kind of medical landscape of Britain. We have a lot of broader history of medicine things than just college focus. So we sort of thinking about particular past epidemics and that kind of thing. We have um, quite a lot of things on smallpox, which I think was never technically classed as a pandemic in the same way possibly, but it was obviously a huge global issue for an uh, enormous number of years. And we actually, in the exhibition, you will see um, that we have a set of lancet blades, which was supposed to have belonged to Edward Jenner, who um, discovered the process of vaccination Again, it's kind of similar to the Newton thing. I'm not entirely certain if they did belong to him, but mm. it seems much more likely because the name is actually engraved on them. Um, and we have a lot of sort of records of what public health measures were going on in Britain at the various times. Um, there's things like the college issued guidance around the bubonic plague, which was adapted to varying extents across the country, um, which again, that, that a particular interest of mine and I think I kept thinking particularly in the early stages of lockdown when there was lots of talk of quarantine and it was like this new really scary thing how similar things were and particularly when you hear kind of dissenting voices around you know quarantine or lockdown like these are issues that have they're not new they have been present for hundreds of years and you know you look at 16th century London and there's accounts of people breaking out of their quarantine houses because either they don't agree that they should be there or they just can't afford to stay quarantined anymore um you know just to give a simple example one example and there's huge amounts of things like that um the, and the college also did a lot of work in the 19th century studying leprosy um mostly in the colonies so that gets all kind of tangled up with imperial medicine and that kind of thing but that was where the Henry Porteous study came from and they were you know studying these kind of huge really impactful diseases the whole time and we have huge amounts there so again if anyone's got any particular interest we have our catalogue online so you can kind of just go there and plug in whatever you want and explore a bit more. Yeah brilliant fantastic there's a couple of questions in the chat so one of them is um, from Steph, who's asking, do you have many other records of patients' experience, like the book that you've shown? We do have some, but I think, like I mentioned, it's not, we have nowhere near as many as we would like, um, so purely because of kind of the nature of how the collection has developed, because most of it, historically at least, was through doctors donating things to us. Mm -hmm. So if we do have a patient voice, it tends to be kind of because it's something that's directly related to the doctor so for example we have some letters that are um i think parents writing to the doctor that treated their child thanking him kind of that sort of thing um or it's just it's just all very sporadic so i think we have the essays diary because it happened to be in a set of papers that someone had or that a past archivist bought and it's all a little bit hit or miss yeah. Um, but that kind of thing is more of a priority for us collecting now because it is such a gap in our collections. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, another question from Elizabeth is, the goddess in the picture of Richard Mead, is yes. that Hygieia? I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Um, and Elizabeth is saying also that there's another portrait of him at the Foundling Hospital um, with whose foundation he was involved, um, and it has a statue of Hygieia in that portrait, so she finds this quite interesting. I cannot quite remember, it's either Hygieia or Athena, and I cannot access the catalogue at this moment to check, but again, that, um, I think you're probably right, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Holly's asking, how do you respond to things that are happening now? Like, do you just try and collect everything, or do you think this will be of interest in the future and be selective. So she's, oh, thinking, she's asking this from the perspective of the current pandemic. Yeah, it's really difficult actually. Um, and then obviously you walk, with things like now, you also get into issues of like, is even though it's, you know, you would think that collecting right now in the middle of things would perhaps be best, but then our focus is physicians in particular, which is doctors who are working in hospitals and therefore now is possibly not the best time to be asking them because they are like so busy and so flat out. Um, 
but in a general sense, so we have kind of set policies about areas we can collect in, and then we work quite closely with other medical museums um, about what people are collecting to make sure we don't cross over too much. So I've been talking to the Science Museum quite a lot because obviously they are much bigger. They've been doing loads of collecting through the whole pandemic, um, which is quite helpful for small places like us, actually, because we know that that sort of wide scale mass collecting is kind of being covered and we can focus more on what our particular um, sort of niche is, which is the physician's experience. Um, in terms of thinking about if what we can just get or compared to what will be interesting in the future, I think it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. So we do kind of actively solicit kind of collecting, like tell people, you know, we are looking to record this. Um, but also we do quite often get people just offering us things and then we kind of weigh everything up with both of those things in mind. And this week we have just launched a collecting campaign focused on not really physical things so much, but more on getting doctors experiences, which we're just doing through a survey monkey. And mm -hmm. that's kind of something we're going to keep, keep plugging away with. But we've only done it at like this year through because it did not seem appropriate in like, you know, last March to be kind of nagging doctors to tell us what was happening when they were sort okay. of, yeah. And what, what about from parents? Sue is asking in the chat about collecting, um, you know, recording different voices um, from parents, from patients, sorry, going through the pandemic. Okay. Um, yeah, we haven't, for COVID specifically, we haven't thought about that yet, because again, I think that's probably something which is better maybe better covered elsewhere and you know I mentioned the science museum I know that they are yeah. collecting that sort of thing um so our initial focus is on the physicians because you know we are the college often so that's our remit but obviously I spoke about not having that voice so um it's something we're thinking about kind of expanding it out to but obviously that again is also quite a sensitive issue particularly if you're talking to families who have you know potentially been going through a really difficult time or grieving and that sort of thing so there's a lot it's quite a Sadly, it's not as simple as you would maybe think it was, but um, yes, it's definitely something we're thinking about. How, how big is the collection? How many objects do you have? Well, I know how big my section is, but mine is probably the smallest. <laughs> so oh. um, we have like the museum as a kind of administrative unit, which I look after, which is about 9,000 items. But then there's also the archive and the rare books and special collections library, and they both have I don't know, they have a lot more. I'm not entirely sure the total numbers. I'd guess around maybe 40,000 total, but that is mostly a number plucked from the air. I should look yeah. that up. Yeah, and how do, you, how do you select a handful of objects from all of that to put this exhibition together? What was that, what was the criteria you used? So this one was a bit different to normal because obviously normally you would have some kind of narrative or overarching topic that you're trying to tell people about um, and you would kind of use that as the basis for your search but because this kind of this one sort of developed a bit more holistically and because we did have the restrictions around lockdown so the way we came at it was I mean this is perhaps not the most curatorially sound method but it was basically just asking everyone like what is cool in the collections that you know we haven't shown people and then kind of <laughs> seeing what the um, themes from that were and kind of putting it together like that which is Perhaps not the best way of doing it, but it's worked really nicely for this, and we want it. Sounds to good to me. What's, yeah, what's, slightly what's more cool, casual. What's cool in the collection? <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. And how can people access the collections? If we've got, uh, you know, people who aren't members of the RCP or they aren't physicians, <clears throat> are your collections available to the public through some other scheme or some other method? Yes. So um, obviously, at the moment, everything's online. So we have a website with loads of information on, and lots of nice pictures as well. Um, our library archive and museum catalogues are all online and then in kind of normal physical times we are open as a museum to the public so um again i don't know if this is going to be the same when we go back but previously it was monday to friday working hours and first thursday of every month late opening uh, we do tours and events and people can just turn up and look around the building as well which uh, so the college of physicians building in next to Regent's Park is grade one listed modernist building designed by Sir Dennis Lasden, but it also has all the historic collections across the whole building and we have a temporary display space and a permanent gallery and we're also open for research appointments for all of the collections. Fantastic. Um, Richard is asking, do you have a photo archive from the flu epidemic of 1918 to 1920? 
Not that I'm aware of, um, but I have to admit that that will be looked after by the archivists and I'm not as familiar with the archive um, as I am with the 3D things. I think we probably have some relevant items, but probably not a full photo archive. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, I was going to ask you on my list of questions was what's your favourite, but you've answered that in that little <laughs> book. It's absolutely brilliant. I can't wait to see that if I can ever. In yeah, physical. it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it's bonkers. Um, also, I found the 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 image of the doctors being mocked quite interesting. And if you think of um, some of the stuff that you see on social media, especially now that's coming around the vaccine and there are lots of misinformations and there's lots of fake news and there's lots of negative comments around the medical industry, around the vaccine industry, all of these things um, and lots of fake news going on about how unsafe it is to take the vaccine, all that kind of stuff. So it shows, I guess, that these themes come back again all the time and, you know, um, doctors are revered but then also they are they are seen as the, the villain um in history yeah the science changes but the social responses don't seem to change that much yeah yeah fantastic um okay i think we've come to an end we don't want to take up too much time we'd like to keep these to about 45 minutes if we can um so i really want to just say thank you um larry um the exhibition will hopefully be up i think you mentioned it hopefully be up later at some point this spring it's hard to hard to say um but it is up online so the whole thing is up there it, you know people can can take their time and see everything um i can tell you that i know it got four stars in the times so there you go that's a good good um good reason to go and see it for sure um and a uh, massive thank you to Larry for taking up time to put, the, to put together the presentation and your expert advice. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you to the RCP for putting on an exhibition like this. It's brilliant. Um, also, a special thank you to Gail Chapman for making this event happen. Gail's at the RCP as well. Um, I just want to share a quick slide with you of our forthcoming events that are coming up. So we have two more private views happening in March, um, one towards the start in literally a fortnight and one towards the end. The first one's in partnership with the University of London um, and uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I can, I can tell you both of these are gonna be brilliant. The second one's our first ever photographic uh, kind of exhibition um, of, of photographs taken um, last year during the start of the pandemic. So really, really interesting. Um, do look at our website um, on Knowledge Quarter and you can sign up on Eventbrite and they are free to attend. So once again, thank you all. Um, oh, I think there might be a question or a comment. No, um, but I do wanna say before you leave, um, do, do feel free to give us some feedback. We'd love to hear what you thought of this event. Could we make it better? Um, any feedback for um, the RCP for their exhibition, we would love to hear. Um, in the chat so before you leave do take out just a minute to write something in there um, and that's it I'll leave you there please take care look after yourselves and we'll see you next time <laughs>